going to sit near the end if others go through first. Right. Yes. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Sort out the seating of the got a chair. Welcome to this inaugural lecture for Professor Henry Montes. A special welcome to uh, my husband, Ray Noga, mother, Reti, and brother, Bernhard Montes. Pleasure to have you with us and also all the other friends who've come from other universities and from the profession to join us for this inaugural lecture. The inaugural lecture is, is an auspicious occasion, both for the individual and for the university. For the individual, it represents uh, the, the goal to which the academic concern has been aspiring for most of her life, to become a full professor at the university, uh, through the having climbed the, the long ladder of degrees and junior love jobs and postdocs and sometimes working in the profession and then finally to make it to uh, the position of professor. So it's important to celebrate that achievement and to mark it. And it's important for the university because it's an opportunity for us to share and showcase some of our staff. The inaugural lecture is a public lecture. It's uh, open not just to uh, the academic colleagues from the faculty and from the discipline, but from the rest of the university and from the public. And so it's a lecture which is aimed uh, at, it's a lecture which is intended to be accessible, I hope this one will be, and I'm sure it will be, accessible to all of us, uh, including those non-lawyers and non-academic lawyers. So um, it's an opportunity for the university to highlight some of the work being done, and within the university for different uh, for colleagues from across the university to learn about each other's work, which we often do not do, off, we don't do often enough because of the silos and departments that we work in. So it's a, a joyous celebration. I welcome you and thank you all for joining us. It's my pleasure to just introduce you to the uh, platform party. If any of you don't know, I'll start at the end, Professor Fisser. Uh, Professor Crane Sudin and Professor Tanvajan and uh, three Deputy Vice Chancellors, uh, Professor Tom Bennett, well known to you, and in the Faculty of Law, the Dean, Professor P.J. Schiffer, and of course our inaugural lecturer this evening. It's my pleasure to invite the Dean to introduce Professor Moss. Professor Henry Mostert this evening. Henry is a can-do, multi-tasking asset to the faculty. Henry completed her arts degree, her LLB degree, her master's and her doctoral degree at the University of Stanford. 1996 was the year in which she was awarded her master's degree and it's in that year that her path to an academic career starts. And she was in that year teaching at University of Stellenbosch, Western Cape, and UNISA, before taking up a fellowship at the Max Planck Institute. In 2000, she was awarded her PhD and became a fellow of the Research Unit for Law and Constitutional Interpretation at Stellenbosch before joining the Faculty of Law there as a senior lecturer in 2001. She then moved rapidly up the academic ranks, becoming a full professor at the University of Stellenbosch in 2007. And this wasn't surprising. In that short space of time, she got an NIF rating, as well as being awarded two prestigious fellowships by the Commonwealth Program and the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. Fortunately for us, Henry decided to relocate to this faculty in 2008. She soon made her presence felt through her warm personality and her remarkable efficiency. 
and that's when I passed. It seemed to me that she would make an ideal director of research on faculty, and she took up that task in 2009. She has been an outstanding director of research for the Royal Faculty. She melded and profiled our Centre for Legal and Applied Research into a flagship brand for the faculty. She's overseen the renovation and expansion of space for the research units on the 6th and 7th floor, something I keep thanking her for. And the 2009 research report reflects our highest publication come to date. Henry has done a whole host of other things. But I hope by just dipping into her administrative contributions, I have painted the picture of a truly excellent administrator and colleague. Henry is also known as an excellent teacher of both undergraduate and postgraduate students. Now having said all that, it is Henry's research record which is her strongest card. Again, in this relatively short space of time, she has published prolifically, attracted a substantial amount of research funding, and established both a national and international profile. One example of which is her recent appointment as a professorial associate at Groningen University. Henry's research interests lie in comparative law, law and development, legal history, and law and society. Within these fields, her research has had a particular emphasis on property law, and in that, land reform, as well as mineral and mining rights. And it is my pleasure to invite Professor Mostert to deliver her inaugural lecture, Accountability and Dependability as Pillars of Property Law. She repeated it and then said, but it doesn't mean anything. And so I tried to explain to her as best I could that it means that I can take something that is mine from anyone who has it. And then she exclaimed, but mom, sharing is caring. <laughs> How does one respond? We do want her to share her toys her books and her sweets with her friends. I have taught her that sharing is caring. And it is one of the first lessons of life, isn't it? Mine is such a cornerstone word. It's a word that we learn early and then we use it frequently and passionately. But no sooner than when we have realized how to assert our claims on the outside world. We are, led to, we are led to realize that there are others who might want our toys, our books, and our sweets. And we learn that there is a code of behavior towards these people who want our things, or who might have stuff of their own that we want. This conversation with Anika made me think again about what we, the teachers of property law, are teaching our students, and why. It has brought me onto the idea of tonight's address, the pillars of property law. In rethinking the teacher's approach to property law, three considerations are important. First, 
the matrices of modern South African property law have changed significantly and they continue to change. We must equip our students with knowledge about the new frontiers of the discipline. Secondly, it's challenging to manage change and simultaneously ensure legal certainty. The tension generated by teaching and studying property law in a transformative context requires a sensitive approach. Thirdly, there are preconceived ideas about the purpose and place of property law and about the individual and social interests such views express. As teachers of the subject, we must be able to address these preconceptions. We must be able, in the words of <coughs> Professor Dennis Cowan, to prune away error paraded as learning. What I propose here is that for property law to function well, we, the members of the South African society, need to understand and practice a particular notion of responsible freedom. Words from Nelson Mandela's biography come to mind. He said that to be free is to live in a way that respects and enhances the freedom of others. To live in a way that respects and enhances the freedom of others. In Germany, a similar sentiment is endorsed by the Federal Constitutional Court. When balancing competing property interests, its point of departure is that property entails a specially constitutionally entrenched duty towards the community. Property rights must be exercised responsibly, not to the benefit of the individual owner only, but also for the community at large. The goals of personal self-realization and the well-being of the community are equally important. This is the social obligation of property. Such an understanding of property law creates institutions and individuals who are accountable in their dealings with property. It also creates dependable outcomes. This is the focus of my address. The question underlying all of this is to what extent our law and context allows for and enables responsible freedom with property. Connie van der Merwe, from whom I heard property law the first time, had a sensible way of beginning his course by giving an overview of the basic principles. Absoluteness, abstraction, publicity, specificity, transmissibility, and the numerous clauses. In the fullness of time, each of these principles takes on a specific meaning for the student of property law. Absoluteness refers to the degree of certainty with which property holders control their property and with which they may be able to protect such control. Abstraction is important because it assists in understanding how and when property may be transferred. Publicity is a major tenet of transactions with property. It supports legal certainty and bolsters the protection that may be afforded property relations. Specificity links a particular piece of property with the rights that may be held in respect of it. Transmissibility refers to the fact that rights to property are, broadly speaking, alienable. The numerous clauses principle confirms that doctrinally, property law relies on closed categories or systems that ownership can be acquired only in a defined number of ways, and that proprietary remedies have clearly defined requirements. This makes for high levels of certainty. As one's learning of the subject progresses, one realizes that these principles, central as they are to the discipline of property law, are not always sufficient. This was most certainly the case in the 1990s, when the very foundations of private property law as we know it were at stake in the negotiations around the incorporation of a property clause into the Constitution. 
there may be people here tonight who were actively involved in shaping or negotiating the Constitution. You will recall, much better than I can retell, just how controversial this particular part of the negotiations were. And how the question about whether property interests deserve constitutional entrenchment was influenced by the historical fact that in South Africa, too many people, for much too long, had been excluded altogether from holding significant property interests. But then I was a first time student of property law. While I was trying to come to grips with the principles of property law, others were debating their continued relevance. Our context was about to transform. What I wanted to know was, what, was whether what I was studying at the time would have any relevance at all in future. Twenty years down the line, it is apparent that the principles of property law are still intact, but their context, their challenges, and their imperatives have changed significantly. Less than a week ago, we celebrated Heritage Day. We could visit our museums and galleries for free. What I'll be doing over the next half hour is to take you on a guided tour of property law, as it were. I shall discuss the most basic principles that the discipline has to offer and give you an impression of the modern context in which these principles must function. I do so for a specific reason. I want to show how the principles of the discipline rely on a code of behavior, a specific code of behavior. It's a code that's older than our constitution and yet is enhanced by it. The code may be summarized in two key words. The first is accountability, which is about responsible ownership as much as it is about the responsibility of the state to create an infrastructure which enables owners and other property interest holders to be responsible. The second is dependability which is about the outcomes of responsible ownership and the expectations upon which it feeds. In this context, I'll be talking about the trust relationship generated by a particular kind of behavior towards property. Accountability and dependability allow the individual, the community at large, and the state to interact the alliances that may be formed amongst these three players in relation to the two pillars of accountability and dependability are many and varied. It is a sense of these intricacies that I hope to leave with you as we proceed through the gallery. Our first stop in the gallery is at the principle of absoluteness. It has also always been misunderstood as a principle of property law. Never in history has an owner's rights to property been absolute. Our modern context shows up the inconsistencies even more starkly. Owners' extensive remedies to protect property are curtailed by considerations of equity and fairness. These considerations <coughs> measure compliance with the constitutional values of dignity, equality, and freedom. The core idea was that property law protects owners better than non-owners and those with acknowledged rights better than those with no rights at all. Andre van der Waal's analysis demonstrated how the new eviction law undermines this core idea. The law expects owners to tolerate even severe inroads on their right, on their right to vindicate property four considerations that 20 years ago would have been labeled extraneous, the personal or social circumstances of unlawful occupiers, and the effect that an, that an eviction will have on their families and communities. That said, considerations which were marginal a few decades ago and which have been pulled to the center of the discipline now do not afford absolute protection to a different interest group. Unlawful occupiers may still be evicted, despite the vulnerability and obvious hardship, if the public interest demands. 
how does our law navigate the situation where both owners and non-owners demand the same kind of protection of their clashing property interests? And does so <coughs> by requiring responsible freedom. The Constitutional Court judgment in Port Elizabeth Municipality versus various occupiers indicated that, indicated that the various interests at play must be balanced in a non-hierarchical way. The court cannot give preference to a claim merely because of its status as a conventional property right or because it is a product of transformative constitutionalism. Moreover, as Juanita Pinara so clearly indicated, eviction is intertwined with the social phenomenon of landlessness and the policy of providing access to adequate housing. In situations such as these, our law expects of an unlawful occupier, someone who has lost trust in the ability of the state to give effect to the fundamental right of access to adequate housing, to trust that the legislative measures against eviction will protect him. Our law also expects of an owner, someone who may very well trust that the existing legal mechanisms will protect her against unlawful occupation of her land, to accept that such mechanisms do not protect absolutely. This goes to the dependability issue, which I argue is an aspect of responsible freedom in respect of property. But our constitutional court expects even more. It expects of the state to fulfill the constitutional duty to improve access to housing systematically. It expects of individuals to contribute to building a society that honors the need for human interdependence, respect, and concern. This means, says the Constitutional Court, that unlawful occupiers should not be stereotyped as a faceless social nuisance. In turn, occupiers should not wallow in feelings of being victimized and helpless. This goes to the accountability issue, which requires of us all, as individuals and as part of a collective, to be proactive in developing a new society. It requires the same of the state. Let us move to another picture in the gallery. The principles of abstraction and publicity. These principles interact, and that's why I'm dealing with them together. I could also include a discussion of the specificity principle, because there's a similar interaction. But for present purposes, I don't want to complicate the discussion, and I'm allowing myself greater leeway than I would have this been a conference paper. The principle of abstraction underlies the theory of tra transfer, prevalent in South African law. It renders the moment of transfer determinable and thus achieves legal certainty and supports the principle of publicity. The latter requires that property transactions must be visibly manifested in the interests of certainty and protection. Land rights must be registered, for instance, to be enforceable against the world at large. The particularly abstract notion of transfer must now serve a broader constituency of users who, for reasons of ignorance, illiteracy, or inexperience, rely on visible manifestations of what they think are legal acts. This means that publicity and abstraction, which should complement each other, are in discord because of our context. Let us look at the burgeoning phenomenon of informal transfer of land in our urban townships as an example. It's urgent for us to deal with this, with the fact of this so-called hand-to-hand transfers. These are transfers of land achieved by simply handing over a, a title deed and accepting payment. It's totally unacceptable in our current structure of property law, of course, and so these transactions remain economically invisible. 
In the words of the economist Amanda de Soto, when property rights and interests are not adequately documented, these assets cannot be readily turned into capital. They cannot be traded outside of narrow local circles where people know and trust each other. And they cannot be used as collateral for security, uh, for a loan. There are only a few studies of this phenomenon at present, but the information that exists suggests that the practice of informal transfer of land is widespread amongst the indigent who cannot afford the formal legal mechanisms available or who do not want to, or do not know how to harness them. The consequences for these users are dire. They effectively nullify the protection and certainty that the formal system provides. Ironically, efforts to facilitate access to adequate housing and to address landlessness are frustrated here, not so much because of the usual complaints of lack of service delivery, but by users ignoring or distrusting the protection already offered by the formal system. The consequence is irresponsible conduct of important property interests. As long as such titles that were effectively taken out of the formal system remain invisible, they cannot generate wealth. The responsibility here is not only on the users of informal transactions with land, but also upon the state to enable a different code of behavior. By ensuring that the formal mechanisms are accessible to the poor, their inability to access the formal system of transfer is due at least in part to the fact that our legal system fails to recognize their business, personal, and hereditary transactions. Trust in the system cannot be generated unless the current approach changes. This example suggests, as did my previous one, that the state has an important role to play in making private property law work. Policies need to serve the, com the, the interests of the community at large. Hence, consultation with the constituencies to be served is important. This is a thread that I would like to follow as we proceed to the next stop in the gallery, which is the numerous clauses principle, or rather that property law relies on closed systems or categories. That South African property law relies on closed systems or categories ensures high levels of certainty in dealings with property. Absent a closed system, the law is inherently more flexible and the options inherently less certain. Although a closed systems approach advances legal certainty, our property law has deviated from it appreciably in the past. The ongoing tension between certainty and flexibility also renders its adaptation to modern conditions difficult. Especially the constitutional imperative to transform land holding presents some challenges. Registered land ownership and limited real rights represent but a small percentage of the rights in land currently utilized in South Africa. Yet, the aspiration behind broadening access to land still is to expand the base of land ownership based on registered title. Ben Cousins has shown that, that such forms of titling cannot appropriately address the demands placed on the land redistribution program. In the rural context, attempts to formalize land hold by relying on land registration practices have the surprisingly opposite effect of what they intend. Enhanced negotiability of land sometimes leads to a consolidation of wealth in the hands of those who can afford land at the expense of the weak and marginalized. Then it compounds insecurity of title rather than alleviating. Alternative solutions must be sought in recognizing a diverse, the, the diverse forms of tenure that have crystallized under customary law and by reinforcing them better than was the case under apartheid. This alternative approach is referred to as the tenure option in land reform circles. The developments around communal land in South Africa and the legal pluralist imperatives of the Constitution 
provide a good example of the challenges to closed systems approaches. Anilka Klaasens has demonstrated, for instance, that users of customary tenure are restricted by that paradigm unless the law provides statutory exit routes. However, the justification for an exit route does not sit well with the Constitutional Court's direction in the Richtersfeld to recognize a parallel system of customary tenure as being equivalent in status to conventional land ownership. So here the court has laid the foundations for two parallel doctrinally closed systems of land holding, <coughs> namely common law title and customary tenure. Whether this can really serve the needs of those living under customary law is an issue that will surely generate much more research. The question remains how certainty and flexibility should interact here. The voices arguing for more flexibility and against registration of layered or nested systems of rights found in customary tenure contexts are persuasive. They are bolstered by the recent achievement of the Legal Resources Center on behalf of various communities in having the entire Communal Land Rights Act declared unconstitutional. The story of the Communal Land Rights Act of Clara is one of a law, an important one, which was dead in the starting blocks. Political wrangling for electoral votes caused rash, irresponsible lawmaking, which cost the South African taxpayer billions without changing the life of even a single rural communal landholder. The moral of the Clara story is one also emphasized globally. Resolving problems with land tenure in the global south is a process dependent on sound policy and manageable procedures. Good governance in the private and public sectors is extremely important, especially where it concerns policy, planning, decision-making, management, and administration. Good governance brings us back once again to those two basic notions of accountability and dependability. It refers to elements such as transparent processes of policy-making, a professional bureaucracy, an accountable executive arm of government, civil participation in public matters, and adherence to the rule of law. As such, it embodies the notion of responsible freedom manifested by accountability and dependability. It also emphasizes what has become something of a theme in this address, how important it is that the state plays an enabling role in allowing holders of property to behave responsibly. Our penultimate stop in the gallery of property law is at the principle of transmissibility. Real rights are freely alienable and transmissible. Importantly, this principle presupposes that property law, property, or, sorry, property is negotiable. There is, however, a category of property that is not negotiable. There are, these are types of property belonging to every book body, res omnium communes, such as the air that we breathe, and property belonging to all people that are administered by the state, res publica such as national parks. Reforms to nat natural resources law have increased these types of property and the rights associated with them. The notion of state custodianship of mineral and petroleum resources introduced by the Mineral and Petroleum Resources Development Act serves as an example. The act, which has been enforced these past six years, established a new legal architecture for the regulation of mineral resources. It has made the state the custodian of mineral and petroleum resources to be administered for the benefit of all the people in South Africa. This legislative overhaul is an attempt to achieve broader access to the mining industry. The underlying strategy is to eliminate practices supporting racialized monopolies within the industry and hoarding of mineral resources. Both these practices, which were widespread in the past, often amounted to irresponsible use of a crucial resource. Interestingly, 
the Act expects a lot from all the players within the industry. As concerns the state, it expects administrative decisions to be made in strictly controlled circumstances and in a manner that takes account of a much broader range of interests than was hitherto the case. As concerns the private sector, and this goes for natural persons as well as juristic persons, the Act also requires administratively responsible behaviour. For example, the transitional provisions of the Act confer, conferred upon previous holders of mineral rights interim substitutes. These interim rights could be converted, but holders had to do the paperwork, which could include, for instance, that they had to show that they were, they were capable of actively exercising the rights which they wanted to convert. Through the notion of custodianship and the responsibilities placed on the right holders, the Act establishes a fairly sophisticated mechanism for government to achieve broader access to and optimal exploitation of our mineral resources without transferring property rights to the state. Nevertheless, the perception is that proprietary relationships were changed irreversibly by the Act. Depending on one's vantage point, two questions are pertinent. First, did the entering into force of the Act cause an expropriation of pre-existing rights for which compensation is payable? Secondly, did the Act nationalize our mineral and petroleum resources? As to the question of expropriation, surely there will be instances in which rights were taken from individuals and appropriated by the state. The Act even foresees such possibilities and provides for it. Such individual expropriations are uncontentious, but some scholars argue that the Act itself expropriated the entire institution of private law mineral rights. I disagree. Expropriation is not subtle. It involves the appropriation by the state of property for payment of compensation and in the public interest. A change in the nomenclature and legal structures regulating mineral resources hardly amounts to an expropriation. Instead, it represents an exercise of the regulatory powers of the state, which may be extensive, but need not be compensated. As to the second question, I think the Act is at pains not to nationalize. It does so, for instance, by the manner in which it creates rights that are theoretically very different from preceding generations of mineral law, but which are functionally equivalent to them. It provides the state with the ability and the responsibility to adjust proprietary positions for the sake of transformation and to compensate those detrimentally affected in the process. It enables the state to do so openly in fulfilling its duty as custodian of the resources. Custodianship is not a metaphor. If the state were to own the mineral resources, we can expect it to act as an owner would do. It would be able to alienate, use, and enjoy the property. The Act does not permit the state to do this. The rights that the Act confers on the state are administrative rights, enabling it to fulfill its custodial responsibilities. Because the state is the custodian of mineral resources, it has a higher responsibility and duty of care than an owner would have. The custodianship model raises the bar on what we can expect as regards the management of our resources. The ongoing nationalization debate in our political arena is about continued exclusion of the poorer classes from the mining industry. It might also be about players in the mining industry wanting to abdicate responsibility in times of economic crisis by expecting the state to step in to save sinking enterprises. I propose that if the mechanisms already in place in our law are harnessed in the right way, there would be no need to cry nationalization. The Act is already strate strategically geared to eradicate exclusionary practices and a property law culture in which accountability and dependability are fostered and promoted would not allow the private sector 
to shrug off responsibilities when the going gets <coughs> tough. The role of the state would be to enable continued optimal exploitation of mineral resources in the national interest. We have one more stop in the gallery. When visiting Boston once, I took a walk through the Isabella Stewart Garden Museum. The premises and the stock were donated to the city by the benefactress whose name the museum now carries. She carefully arranged all the exhibitions, and her bequest was subject to the condition that nothing ever had to be changed or rearranged. While walking through that magical place, I noticed a large, empty picture frame hanging between some of the other art. One of the guards probably noticed that I was intrigued, so, uh, so he came up to me to explain. He told me that the frame housed an early Rembrandt painting that was stolen many years before, along with other valuable art. True to the wishes of the lady, the empty frame was left hanging among the other pictures exactly where, where the Rembrandt painting used to be. The guard said to me, those paintings must have something to come home to. In the gallery of property law, there is also an empty frame. We, the students and teachers of property law, know inherently that there is something more to property law than the six principles I've just discussed. It is something that goes to the core of the discipline. It is something quite self-evident, something with ancient roots and modern offshoots. It is the notion that property entails not only rights but also responsibilities. It is the knowledge that fulfilling such responsibilities creates relationships of trust, which is the very foundation upon which a property law is constructed. What I mean by accountability and dependability in property law has to do with this relationship between responsible freedom and trust. The knowledge that exists between owners, the state, and the community at large that a certain code of behavior is necessary for the structures of property law to ensure certainty and efficiency. I want to fill this empty frame with these dual notions of dependability and accountability, and I want to call it the principle of responsibility. What I've tried to do in the course of this afternoon is to demonstrate how this principle of responsibility underlies all other knowledge of and actions in property law. I have dissected its different elements. I've named it accountability and dependability. I have mentioned examples to demonstrate that accountability pertains to responsible freedom to be exercised by the private person, natural or juristic, and the state's obligation to provide good governance. I have indicated that dependability pertains to the expectations created by the community at large and by individuals in relation to the manner in which those who hold property rights exercise them. In putting together our student tech textbook last year, Anne Pope and I realized that responsible freedom and trust and the trust it generates are concepts that have hitherto not been a part of any discussion about the principles of property law. We've begun developing our ideas about this. And I look forward to much more of the enjoyable collaboration that has sprouted from that project. For now, let me say, just say this, that a principled approach to property law cannot deny the impact of responsible freedom and trust on the content and function of property law. Our aspirational constitutional court jurisprudence in decisions such as PE municipality evidently supports this understanding. But aspirations are hampered by harsh realities. Service delivery is constrained. Some levels of the state, municipalities specifically, have limited competencies, capacity, and means with which they must service a whole range of expectations. I want to conclude by saying that having high expectations is not bad. We, the members of the South African society, should be expecting good governance and better service delivery. 
we should be expecting the state to fulfill its custodial responsibilities in respect of the Mineral and Petroleum Resources Act. We should be expecting the state to come up with workable policies and laws to deal with informal land transfers and to serve the interests of communal land users. But we must have similarly high expectations on ourselves as individual users of property law and as members of the public. Yes, the state must be an enabling agent of responsible freedom, but it is also the citizens, both owners and non-owners, that must make property law work. It is the respect that we have for property, our own and that of others, that gives the principles of this discipline their meaning. It is about this code of behavior that I want to teach my students. Honored members of this assembly, all that remains is for me to say a few words of thanks. An inaugural address is an important beacon <coughs> in the journey that is an academic career. It's a journey upon which one does not embark without the support and advice of those who are better and more experienced at navigating what sometimes might be the stormy waters of life and academe. I have been privileged to have had the benefit of excellent support from so many sources. Family, friends, mentors, colleagues, research assistants, administrators, funders, publishers, the list goes on and on. I'm not going to single out anyone now. I only want to say three collective thank yous. The first is to my former colleagues from the University of Stellenbosch, which was my first academic home. The second is to the colleagues and institutions abroad who have provided academic havens and have broadened my horizons. The third is to my current colleagues at UCT, where I'm fortunate to enjoy a strong tailwind of support, enabling me to reach destinations that I would otherwise only have dreamed of. I also have two personal thank yous. The first is to my brother and mother. It's really special that you traveled far to be here tonight. I appreciate that very much. Even more so, because the space next to you is empty. My father first instilled in me the notion of responsible freedom, and we should have been here tonight. And to Rainer, my husband, with whom I can talk about anything in life and law. It's a real privilege for me to be able to explore the values of responsibility, freedom, and trust with you on another level. Thank you.
ah, something that we all know, what's mine is mine, and everyone leave it alone. I'm very thankful that she started at this level. Her analysis of what's mine is mine, and then all of the complex elaboration of the responsibilities of property, began at the feet of Corley von der Merwe 20 years ago. My, uh, I hesitate to say love affair, hate affair really, with property began 45 years ago. And in those distant times, and there's one person in the audience who can please share this with me, in those distant times of that institution, property was a profoundly scholarly affair. And given the sharp distinction between public and private law, there was none of the spice of politics to give it uh, any interest or relevance. We had nothing about labor tenancies, forced removals, implementation of the Group Areas Act. That was all shuffled off into constitutional law where it got very short mention because constitutional law was also taught really as legal history. Instead, for us, property law was taught at a high intellectual level. And to make sure that we understood it properly, we actually had four bites at it. It was taught, first of all, in Roman Law 1. Then it came back to us as a special subject in Roman Law 2. Then we had a full course of it in Roman Dutch Law 1. And if we hadn't got the message, it came back yet again in the final year as a select topic. Um, I'm ashamed to say, really, that despite all of this teaching, it remained a mystery to me. <laughs> and all of those six principles, which are there on the board, uh, remained completely abstract and without any real significance. I really enjoyed Henry's approach to this topic. The six principles underlying this conceptual labyrinth, uh, she gave a real tangible feel by introducing them as the six pictures in the gallery. It makes this discipline immediately uh, something one can fasten on to. But she's taken the subject much further. She introduced an entirely new way of thinking about property. That selfish, absolute right which we certainly grew up with in our multiple teachings of the subject when I was a student, um, this is somehow now transformed into a duty towards the community. A duty that means that the right of ownership must be exercised responsibly towards the community at large. In this way, the goals of personal self-realization and communal well-being can both be realized. And these rights and duties are presented in terms of the state's obligation to maintain a framework that will enable all the parties to realize responsible exercise of freedom. In this way, the law is made both dependable and the right holders accountable to pillars of her talk tonight. Hungary's knocked down those barriers between public and private law. She's opened up a topic that can so easily be presented as somehow irrelevant, as mere intellectual history. She's made it, and forgive the pun here, yeah, she's made it real. <laughs> Henry, <laughs> congratulations. You have really served us all extremely well with this talk tonight. trying to figure out uh, where does, how does, what is the consistent set of principles uh, with which uh, an activist or a person concerned about the poor can deal with issues of evictions, uh, the um, different rights to property and the rights of the landowners vis-a-vis -vis the tenants and the rights of the city to get their dues paid before the property is transferred and 
these seem insoluble to me, and I, I, I think as a, as a lay person, throw up my hands and thank the universities that there are academics who think about this and try to understand it and try to make it more sensible for all of us. And Henry has certainly done that for us tonight, and done it in the most eloquent uh, and uh, beautiful way. So thank you from all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, it concludes the formal event. We have refreshments and drinks upstairs and we hope you'll join us there and you'll have an opportunity to talk to and congratulate Henry yourself. And um, if you'll just give the platform party a moment to leave first and then because we want the food and then uh, join us upstairs. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank <laughs> you.